Well, and thank you for joining us today on this UMDF Adult Advisory Council Team webinar. We're focusing on the important sleep for the mitochondrial disease patient. And before we start, stall me some time to talk a little bit about some upcoming UMDF events and to go over some webinar housekeeping items with you. First, this webinar would not have been possible had it not been suggested and developed by our Adult Advisory Council team. Specifically, ACT's co-chairs, Gail Welling and Joy Crumdiak. So we thank them both for their suggestions and help getting set up. And secondly, if you are an adult or a young adult, we suggest that you visit our Adult Advisory Council team page. It is on the UDF website, and you can take some time there. Uh, after this and go and take a look at some of the resources they have. They're very easy to find. I put the website up there for you. It's umdf.org forward slash act. So there, take some look at, uh, look at some of the helpful resources and tips. And also, you can connect with other adults and young adults, so please check this out. Secondly, we have the Mitochondrial Disease um, Symposium, the UMDF Symposium that is coming Coming up, Mitochondrial Medicine 2018 takes place in Nashville this year. Patient, family, and LHON sessions occur June 28th through the 30th. Sleep is going to be a topic for one of the adult sessions this year, along with another uh, topic in, that affects the adult and young adult community. So we would really love for you to join us. And you can go and uh, visit udf.org forward slash symposium additional details about the program schedule and registration information. And finally, we have a number of pre-submitted questions. We sent out a number of emails on that earlier, but I do want to allow you the opportunity if you want to ask a question on this webinar. We'll try to get to some of them. So if you ask a question, well, first click on the Q&A tab on your screen, at the top of your screen, then type your question in the box where it says type your question here, and then click send, and I should see your question and we should be able to get it answered. A word about the questions. We're only answering questions pertaining to sleep. Having said that, we are incredibly delighted to have with us this afternoon or this morning, depending where you are, uh, Dr. Bruce Cohen from Akron Children's Hospital in Akron, Ohio. I know many of you know Dr. Cohen. He is so incredibly busy, and we are so grateful for him to have the privilege of his time this afternoon. So without further delay, how Dr. Cohen. <clears throat> Hi. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, thank you, Cliff. Thank you for the uh, great introduction. I'm really happy to be um here talking about sleep. Um, whenever I give talks about mitochondrial disease, there's always a slide, and in in the, at the end talking about um, you know treatments of mitochondrial disease. And I always mention sleep on that slide. I really haven't given talks about sleep and mitochondrial disease and why it's important. So it's going to be my first opportunity to uh, present an entire lecture on sleep. Um, I'm not a sleep doctor, um, but I can tell you that um, the issues about sleep come up very frequently in mitochondrial visits. So this, I saw seven patients, five of the patients had a mitochondrial disease, and sleep dominated the discussion um, with two of those patients. So uh, again, it's something that uh, is important to folks with mitochondrial illness, um, both adults and children. Uh, but there are a different set of problems in children and adults. So further introduction, go on to the next slide, um, and ask the question, why do we sleep? And uh, this is something that I, uh, you know, have this sort of uh, slide that once I want to engine to and, and, you know, chill a little bit. Uh, one is that it makes us feel better. Uh, but it also um, makes us more energetic. We're happier when we sleep. We're alert. And interesting, um, there's drivers of tiredness and hunger that are very similar. And these tri drivers tell us what we need to do. Uh, when we get hungry, we eat. Um, that's physiologically very important to stay alive. And when we get tired, we sleep, which is, really is physiologically important to stay alive. Um, would obviously result, will result in death, 
um, but lack of sleep will result in death as well. Uh, so, uh, uh, but really doesn't get down to the issue and why we sleep. What, do, what would a biologist say? So let's move to the next slide, Cliff. Uh, there are several theories, and no one knows what the real theory is, the real reason, and it's probably a combination of a whole bunch of different reasons. So one of the earlier theories was a theory called inactivity theory. And, you know, at night, um, staying, al staying alive actually um, uh, was not so easy, um, and, and being very inactive uh, at certain times of the day may actually protect um, the animal from danger. And so one of the theories about sleeping is that <clears throat> When you're still, when you're still, you're quiet, and when you're quiet, no one's going to find you, and no other animal's going to find you and eat you. Um, and this is a, one of the older theories, and may still have some uh, validity. Uh, a theory is uh, energy conservation. When we're asleep, our bodies use about 10% less energy than we use when we're awake and, and lying around. So the effect of going to sleep decreases the metabolic rate by 10%, and certainly that something someone with a mitochondrial disease would understand as being critically important. But that's really not the entire um, explanation as well. This um, theory is a restorative theory. Not the next slide, the next theory, restorative theory. Interesting is we stay awake, the body builds up compounds um, that are lost during sleep. And, um, and, and like the body... Um, uh, when it's awake, this is compounds that are replenished when we, we sleep. So what is compounds, um, and the, the, the name adenosine may look familiar because it's the root of, of AD adenosine triphosphate. Adenosine builds up during wakefulness and disappears during sleep. It's interesting that caffeine blocks the effect of adenosine. So as adenosine builds up, we get tired. And tiredness is the driver for sleep. And caffeine blocks adenosine from making us tired. Uh, that's why caffeine is a good stimulant medication. Uh, animals deprived of sleep develop an immune deficiency and die within weeks. Um, keeping them awake has been used as acts of torture um, because people really do lose the ability to um, really function. And um, again, when people are deprived of sleep um, as a form of torture, uh, death does result. Brain plasticity theory, um, in that sleep plays a critical role in brain development, and if sleep correlates with the inability to learn. And obviously, you know, we can take that one step further. When we're sleepy, we don't learn very well. So I say is that all animals sleep, and it's a, it's, it's a requirement for life. So next slide. What is not getting enough sleep? So um, these are all pretty obvious at the top of the list. But you might have heard about some of these at the bottom of the list. Um, first of all, we get tired, and that's uncomfortable. We have judgment when we don't sleep enough. If you um, tend on a person with lack of sleep, you, you quickly understand they don't learn well, their reasoning is poor, math skills deteriorate, and inability to concentrate. Hence, occur when we don't get enough sleep. So if... <clears throat> You you get asleep enough at night, um, you can go really the next day uh, just you know filled with headaches. To eat is increased when we don't get enough sleep, and food is used often uh, as a way to keep uh, awake. So uh, you're driving in the car and you're tired, um, munching on food actually is a way to to keep awake. Uh, so <clears throat> Uh, that's so good if you're eating uh, food all the time. Uh, going to gain weight. Enough sleep, you're going to be be in a bad mood. Um, you know this has been shown, um, uh, you know, in multiple studies, um, and uh, uh, that's a good thing. Um, become disoriented, have hallucinations, and even paranoia. Yeah. People with poor sleep. Um, there's a massive increase in somatic complaints. Somatic complaints, the, the biggest somatic complaint is your body aches. Also increase in other pain, pain complaints. So people with chronic pain 
um, who don't sleep well, their pain is, is much worse as well. Finally, there's an increased risk of heart attacks, irregular heart beat, high blood pressure, stroke, and diabetes in those with poor sleep. So, so <clears throat> I went looking up for brain circuitry uh, for sleep and came up with this diagram. And uh, this is, of course, meaningless to all of us. Uh, but this is an electrical engineer's uh, 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 version of why um, what happens to initiate sleep in the brain. Um, this may not be much better. Um, if we can go on to the next slide. Oh, Cliff, let's go advance one slide. Okay, electrical circuitry, and then the second slide. Uh, this is a brain circuitry in sleep. And you see those little colored balls. Um, uh, in, in reality, those are nerve cells within the brain uh, that initiate sleep and um, uh, and uh, wakefulness. Um, and the brain, the, these balls located in the brain are located in the, the air brain called the hypothalamus, which is above the brain stem as well as the brain stem. One of the things you may be thinking about right now is, don't mitochondrial disease affect brainstem function? And the answer is, in many cases, yes. So, especially in children with Lee syndrome, but not also some adult onset mitochondrial diseases, the brain that actually mediates sleep and wakefulness uh, can get injured and therefore disrupt sleep patterns. Um, this, so, the diagram on the right shows that there's put into uh, many aspects of um, sleep neurons, uh, light and dark, emotional state, energy balance, or metabolic cues initiate sleep. Uh, all this is that uh, it's normal um, energy is a balance between sleep and wake, um, sleepiness and wakefulness. And we go through a cycle um, of wakefulness and sleep and and this was originally driven by how much sunlight, you know, there is uh, available to us um, of other inputs. And this diagram also shows the effect of caffeine that blocks the effect of the scene, which builds up during the time when we're awake. Uh, excess of adenosine makes us tired, which um, is the cycle of time to go to bed. Um, Cliff, we can do the next slide. I skipped. Oh, sorry, I skipped. Do neurologic disorders uh, that can impact on sleep. Uh, I did not put mitochondrial disease on this list. I wanted to keep it a uh, list of um, the common, uh, common neurologic disorders um, that most people have heard about. So pretty much all the dementias, including Alzheimer's disease, affect sleep. And the, the um, manifestations of Alzheimer's disease is due to the deterioration of, of the nerve cells in the brain. Uh, how much of the uh, behavior of Alzheimer's disease is due to lack of normal sleep isn't quite clear. But obviously, lack of sleep making um, um, Cognitive, uh, excuse me one second, there's a fire alarm going off in the hospital. I'm just going to cover up my phone for one minute. Okay, sorry about that. So, um, <clears throat> again, uh, the point being is that dementia is a key feature of Alzheimer's disease, but lack of ability to concentrate and make good decisions is a key feature of lack of sleep. And Alzheimer's disease affects the quality and quantity of sleep. This is so true of Parkinson's disease, people with brain malformations, injury, multis, nerve disease, and a body mass index. Um, uh, obesity itself, beyond the fact that it can obstruct normal breathing patterns, um, um, in mitochondrial patients, which can be a result of the myopathy. Uh, can affect sleep as well. When neurologists talk about sleep, one of the key features is that if you've got a patient with a neurologic disease, always in mind that part of the problem may be 
um, they're not well, and you need to take a look into it. So let's next slide. So four sleep disorders um, that we're going to uh, talk about today. The first one is insomnia. That's the inability to fall asleep, to fall asleep, uh, taking out to fall asleep. Uh, it's also defined as people who once fall asleep will wake up repeatedly in the middle of the night. Uh, it's about 10% of people in the United States. Um, they, and the people suffer from chronic insomnia. The sex order, which we're probably going to spend most time talking about this afternoon, is apnea, which affects probably between 5 and 7% of all adults. Sleep apnea uh, comes in several forms, obstructive sleep apnea, sleep apnea, and the mixed obstructive central sleep apnea. And again, we'll go to a little, little bit more detail later on, but obstructive sleep apnea means something is blocking the airway, obstructing the flow of air uh, from the mouth into of the lungs. Sleep apnea is defined as something going on inside the brain that interfering with the drive to breathe during sleep. And apnea uh, involves both of these issues. Uh, the problem is restless leg syndrome, which is to some extent in about 10% of adults and 10% of children. <clears throat> a, lot, a lot of restless leg syndrome um, is not a daily event. Uh, but it's people when they're not feeling well um, or they are really tired or exhausted. And finally, narcolepsy, which is about 1 in 2,000 people. And narcolepsy is the sudden urge to sleep at times you shouldn't be sleeping like the middle of the day. And there are many different uh, flavors of narcolepsy, including a more severe version called cataplexy, when people will fall asleep suddenly in the middle of the day. So narcolepsy is a syn syndrome where you're, 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 you you just slept eight hours, you're driving to work, and you're excessively tired and need to pull off to the side of the road uh, and, and, and and fall asleep. Uh, fall asleep. People who fall asleep quickly in class, um, maybe a narcoleptic cataplexy is you're, you're sitting at your desk, someone comes in and tells you a funny joke, you laugh. And you go from laughing to being totally asleep, and you know you just fall to the ground. Uh, it happens instantly. People with mitochondrial disease <clears throat> have an increased risk of insomnia, an increased risk of sleep apnea, and rest leg syndrome. Narcolepsy doesn't seem to be um, an issue in um, mito and mitochondrial disease, um, outside the fact that if you're insomnia and sleep apnea and restless leg syndrome, you haven't slept. Um, and so you do want you you can fall asleep very quickly in the middle of the day. Uh, but that's probably not real narcolepsy. That's the fact that someone just hasn't slept at all and they're tired and exhausted from lack of sleep. <clears throat> um, less common um sleep disorder um it's something that sort of it's 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 talked about in lectures of sleep. Uh, really pertinent to mitochondrial disease is um, excess nightmares, excess sleepwalking, sleep talking, um, and, and they're called parasomnias, and we're really going to talk, talk about those today. Next slide, please. This is when we fall asleep. Um, this is called the sleep cycle diagram, and uh, what you seen on the right is a healthy um, Typical eight-hour sleep cycle diagram. So about the the sleep cycle, uh, we all know what wakefulness is about. Um, I know I'm feeling awake. Hopefully, Cliff's feeling awake, and hopefully, most of you haven't drifted off into stage one or stage two sleep right now. Uh, so one sleep is drowsiness, also called pre-sleep, and um, someone is um, dead, um, then their eyes start to roll around. Uh, we, um, you know, as we're watching TV at night, we can feel ourselves drifting off sleep. During stage one sleep, it will arouse someone by calling their name. Um, uh, often people will drop to stage one sleep um, during the commercial break. And when, you know, the show comes back on, they, they, 
they can wake themselves up out of state one sleep to start watching the TV show again. Stay one sleep lasts a variable amount of time, uh, depending on how sleepy you are. Some people go quick stage one to stage two. Other people spend more time in stage one. Um, stage two sleep is the predominant sleep stage. Again, still easy to awaken from, but this one when uh, we're watching TV, all of a sudden, if you're waking from stage two sleep, you'll realize that you stopped listening to the TV show and that um, – you, you know, um, seeing, you know, it, your, your brain has turned dark. Um, and this is, we, we spend a lot of time at night in stage two sleep. And in a healthy state, as time marches on, as we, we get, you know, 20 minutes into sleep, 30 minutes into sleep, 40 minutes into sleep, we slip into stage three and stage four sleep, is where the brain waves really slow down and we enter deep sleep. Uh, you you know, kids, children sort of enter deep sleep far more deeply than adults. But if you awaken, awaken someone out of stage four sleep, you may not be able to get them awake. They're that asleep. And um, this is where it's a very important part of our sleep. And, uh, uh, and a lot of regeneration in terms of uh, chemicals in the brain take place in stage three and four sleep. Interesting, this appear this stage three and four disappears in old age and in people with neurologic brain diseases like Parkinson's disease or Alzheimer's disease. Um and they get the, the pathology on how uh, uh, of, of these diseases um and dementia with these diseases maybe as much as uh the love of sleep uh, as it is the disease itself. In stage three and four sleep, people don't move. Um, they 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 lie there breathing but not moving at all. A lot of the nightmares and um, sleepwalking and sleep talking occur right out of stage four sleep, um, also called slow wave sleep. That's what the SWS means. Uh, and if you and and these disorders are considered disorders of slow wave sleep. What happens um, is um, you stomach back out of stage four into stage three and stage three into stage two and stage two into stage one, and then you enter rapid eye movement sleep. Um, this may be the most important part of our sleep. If to time it, um, take the rapid eye movement sleep is far more damaging than taking away stage four sleep. Sleep uh, is where your uh, it's called rapid eye movement sleep. And during REM sleep, your muscles become completely limp, um, it's paralyzed, um, and the the EG brainwave pattern changes. And this is when we dream. Uh, sleep can last, you know, anywhere from a few minutes to ten or twenty minutes. And um, <clears throat> often during REM sleep, we'll see um, uh, wake completely. Um, we may not remember we're awake completely, but we actually wake up completely or wake up immediately into stage one sleep again, and then stage two, stage three, and stage four. So the the first cycle um, of sleep may take between 90 and 120 minutes, and then we go to a second cycle and a third cycle and a fourth cycle. And you can see as we hit more and more cycles of sleep at night, um, the, the four sleep becomes less and less and shorter and shorter. And the final cycle or two, depending on how long we actually stay asleep, uh, we'll shuffle around between stage one and stage two and REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep. And then we wake up, our laptop you know, wakes us up, and then we're off to our daily business. And so that's the typical eight-hour sleep cycle. And interrupting this, uh, is going to affect our ability to function the next day. Again, uh, we think that memories and learning solidify uh, during REM sleep, um, during light sleep. So we can have the slide. I see patients all the time. Sleeping and sleeping well are two different things. And that, I just want to repeat something that we've said on earlier slides. You may have a sleep disorder if you suffer from headaches, fatigue, irritability, 
ability. You find you're eating to stay awake. Your body aches without an obvious cause. Difficulty concentrating. Mood disturbance. Um, pains need to move the legs at night. Uh, as you read through this list, you may say, well, gosh, aren't those the symptoms of mitochondrial disease? And the answer is, yes, they can be. Uh, I really get into the um, – talk about the disorder of um, resting syndrome um, a bit later. Um, but there are two main things that interrupt sleep, and one be sleep apnea, and the second is this restless leg syndrome. Let's on sleep apnea. And again, there are two main causes. If we look at the picture on the left, we see the explanation for obstructive sleep apnea. So when we breathe, uh, we've taken air, which is shown in green uh, on the slide. We take in air through our nose or our mouth, um, and it ends up in our in the back of our throat into our trachea. Uh, you can see the top diagram on the left. So normal air flow flow through our, our nose or our mouth. Some of us are mouth breathers, some of us are nose breathers. Uh, you can see the robust green uh, airflow going in, uh, into our lungs. With obstructive sleep apnea, the, te the, the tongue tends to fall back um, uh, and struck the uh, flow of air into, um, into our chia and then and knock it into our lungs. So the, the the flow of air is actually obstructed and stop breathing. That's what apnea means. So the definition of apnea is breathing for uh, no airflow for 30 seconds or more. Um, sleep apnea is extremely common in patients with weakness and myopathy, and that's because the muscles that hold the network of tissue in position are weak and subject to um, um, basically allowing the tongue to fall back and, and the airway closing. With obstructive sleep apnea, um, they, um, and it just occurs during sleep, is the air falls back, it shuts, and, down, and then there's no air flow. And then uh, after 30 seconds, uh, uh starts to happen. Um, uh, the body senses a lack of of oxygen and increased carbon dioxide starts to struggle, and then wakes up, and they will often wake up in a snore, a snore, um, and um, that's what, you know, the, and, and suck the air in uh, using diaphragmatic muscles. Uh, again, that snoring sound, um, which help themselves and any bed partner, and sometimes the rest of the household. And you know that people that snore will often snore. Or continuously, that's not apnea, that's snoring, uh, but often um, slip right back into an apneic phase um, within seconds of taking a single snoring breath. And so, uh, again, talking to a bed party, you'll say, yeah, they'll, they go for three seconds, or, you know, they don't, they don't breathe, and then they snore and they wake me up, and, and the next thing they know is they're snoring again. And so this, the, these apneic spells can occur repeatedly through the night, sometimes stringing one of them together in a five-minute period. And that obstructive sleep apnea. With central sleep apnea, there's just a drive to breathe. The drive to breathe is shut down for 10 or 20 seconds, 30 seconds, 40 seconds. Um, and the person can wake up because of this lack of oxygen and carbon dioxide increase. Um, and then and then breathe. And those are the two main forms of sleep apnea. And uh, obstructive sleep apnea occurs in mitochondrial disease because of the myopathy. Um, central sleep apnea occurs in mitochondrial disease because of the brain injury uh, that can coexist as part of the mitochondrial disease itself. An additional factor with myopathy is um, the driver for much of the sleep, uh, much of the uh, breathing movement, and the driver is the muscle uh, diaphragm. The diaphragm is a gigantic muscle that we never think about um, that's beneath the lungs. Um, it actually acts as bellows to uh, pull air into the lungs. 
and uh, the 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 nerve signals that come uh, to the diaphragm for it to contract to a, that that allow us to breathe. Uh, again, uh, the diaphragm can be weakened by the muscle disease associated with mitochondrial disease, and again, due uh, uh, to the combination of uh, both obstructive and central sleep apnea. So go about diagnosing a patient. With, uh, um, can you go to the next slide? I forgot to ask you to advance the slide, and that's the diaphragm. That's that sort of um, peach color muscle. So about diagnosing um, 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 apnea and restless leg syndrome, it's a test called the polysomnogram. Someone who's had a polysomnogram 10 years ago remembers the the, um, the routine. Uh, models had set up sleep um, sleep lamps in ho hotel rooms because it was cheaper to do that than use a room at the hospital. So the sleep labs were at hospitals or clinics, and they'd get there at you know, nine o'clock at night, bring a book. Um, they spend about an hour hooking you up to, to um, electrodes and um, ask you to get in bed and then say go to sleep. Take a look at where these electrodes are. Uh, there's sensors on the face, scalp, near the eyes uh, that will measure um, uh, jaw movement, face movement, and wave activity. There's all sensor uh, sensing airflow through the nose. Um, uh, so you can detect air in and out of the nose. Um, uh, a chest, um, a chest that senses chest wall movement, and a little strap that uh, is around the stomach area, um, and because uh, there's that can be used down in the stomach area to help you breathe. There's a, a, a red uh, laser device put on the finger um, that senses the amount of oxygen in the blood. Um, Sasal uh, flow can actually measure carbon dioxide uh, coming out of your nose. And electrical signals are fed into a computer that actually um, uh, measures goes on during your sleep. Now, I said 10 years ago these were done in in, in laboratories and in hotel rooms and hospital. Uh, what's no more common is um, that you either get hooked up by a technologist and go home, or they actually just ship the kit to you um, and put these electrodes on yourself. Uh, they come with instructions. And if the you know you either plug something in, um, uh, or it, it records into an independent recording device, and you mail everything back, and that's your, your sleep study. <clears throat> um, the home kits are becoming more popular because they're a lot cheaper to do um, than bringing people into hotel rooms, and the quality of the data is actually pretty good. And so you can get a a, a real study and sleep in your home bed, which is a much more natural. Um, environment and reflects uh, more accurately what's going on than going into a hotel room. Um, so uh, that that is changing. The next slide. This is what the recording of a polysomnogram looks like. Um, the top recording is the brainwave electroencephalogram and allows uh, um, the physician interpreting the study to know whether or not you're in stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four, REM sleep, or you're awake. Because brain waves look different in each stage of sleep. Uh, and then you'll see this uh, line will reflect um, activity measured in the jaw. Um, and this sort of helps determine whether or not uh, what sleep that you're in um, is, is so it, it sort of helps correlate with the EEG to determine if there's uh, movements going on. Uh, the line is the nasal or air, oral airflow, and you can see that the first three waves are breathing in and breathing out waves, and for a 30 second period or longer, there's no flow going in and out of the nose or mouth, and that's what's called apnea. So what you actually see. Um, a period of apnea is that there's no flow of air going in or out. Um, 
the next wave is the chest wall movement. And you see with the, during the period of apnea, uh, the chest wall is trying to move. The brain is sending, in this case, the brain is sending signals uh, to the muscles, uh, the diaphragm and the muscles of the chest saying, hey, breathe. Uh, but there's no airflow. And so that's what you would see, the pattern you would see in obstructive sleep apnea. Chest is trying to suck air in, but nothing's coming in. And then finally, the person takes a really big breath, and that's when you get the snore. Uh, this line is the abdominal movement, and you often see muscles uh, moving in the opposite direction in the stomach muscles when one is, is, is apneic. Um, during a period of apnea, the oxygen saturation in the bloodstream can fall from normal uh, to very low, and that means the brain is not getting enough oxygen. That's a bad thing. And you actually see um, changes in the heart, heart rhythm well. The heart will slow down, also not a bad thing. During the period of apnea, uh, the, or the end of the apnea phase, when a person is taking that big breath, and or snore, you see the EE change uh, from REM sleep to awake state, or you may see it, you know, from stage two sleep to awake state, and that tells the reviewer uh, that person is waking up because of the apnea. And if you're waking up 200 times a night, uh, that's going to be uh, not a night sleep. So we take the next slide. Um, in the slide I showed you sort of a artist drawing of what a polysomogram looks like. This is really what they look like. Um, so they, they come out as traits that look like this. Uh, back in the old days, uh, 10, 15 years ago, the physician would have to hand score. Um, so they'd sit and look at this for six or eight. They'd sit and look at, you know, paper um, or an electric recording for six or eight hours of sleep. It may take them an hour or so to review all that. Um, nowadays, the um, computer does the interpretation and if it, uh, it signs off on it in just a few minutes. <clears throat> and this is how sleep apnea diagnosed. Um, I didn't do a recording of essential sleep apnea, but in essential sleep apnea, uh, chest wall doesn't move uh, during a period of lack of airflow. How do you sleep apnea? Well, there are a number of different ways. We can go to the next slide. The first way is um, use as much anymore. Um, CPAP or continuous positive airway pressure. And the CPAP device the machine delivers um, a pressure air, air, pressure of air generally through the nose. Um, um, and it, that pressure is continuous. And so when the person breathes in, the machine sort of blows air into the lungs. And that's not a particularly uncomfortable feeling. It's sort of unusual until you get used to it. Um, and the person has to breathe out and push against that continuous positive airway pressure, which is very uncomfortable to do and can create a choking feeling uh, or a claustrophobic feeling and a panic feeling. So patients, when they put their CPAP mask on, the breath is in, they say, oh, this isn't so bad, and then a half a second later, it's time to put the air out, and they, they grab the mask and take it off and say, I can't deal with this, because uh, it is that uncomfortable feeling. Uh, um, and the people that are weak um, have, my, they have actually have a difficult time pushing the air out through their nose uh, this continuous positive airway pressure. Uh, so that didn't work out well for a lot of people. In addition, um, you'd really be a nose breather for this device to work well for most situations. And a lot of people are mouth breathers, so then you'd have to chin strap on. And this was an elastic strap that wrapped around your bottom of your chin and the top of your head to, to help keep your mouth closed. And um, uh, that's the CPAP. Uh, BiPAP is bilevel positive airway pressure. So with a BiPAP machine, uh, the, you get the as you breathe in, you get the nice flow of air into your lungs, 
as soon as you stop breathing in and start breathing out, the machine senses this, and there's not a lot of positive pressure. So you're pushing air out through your nose, again, little pressure, and that's a lot easier uh, for people to deal with, and it gets rid of that choking or claustrophobic feeling. So more machines are moving over to the BiPAP mode, um, uh, and uh, it's, people are more comfortable with BiPAP in general than CPAP. And so you can buy a machine that says CPAP, but maybe uh, delivered deliver you BiPAP. Um, I think most machines sold today are BiPAP machines. Inhalation is one step further, and that's where you get the sort of the the machine pushing the air in, um, uh, and, uh, and and then the pressure drops to zero. So uh, you passively breathe out against no pressure, and the machine is set to give you a certain number of breaths per minute. Um, uh, you know, the machine actually does the almost does the breathing for you. So in people with really severe central apnea. Uh, they transition from a BiPAP machine into a nasal ventilation machine, uh, which doesn't look a lot different than a BiPAP machine. Uh, really, the machine doing the breathing uh, for you while you sleep. <clears throat> if you listen to the radio, you hear ads um, for these dental appliances uh, that stop snoring and stop ap you know, sleep apnea. Uh, you work for a certain percentage of the population. Um, I really not had any patients with mitochondrial disease where these appliances have worked well. Um, they, you know, they, they basically push the tongue down. Some of them have a elastic strip that goes around the tongue, sort of pulls it out. Um, I can't imagine this being a comfortable um, sleep apnea. There's a device that's uh, similar to something that we use um, in a tool that's called nasal trumpet. A sort of a rubber type material that stick in your nose, and it it, it it goes back into the airway, into the into the sinus airway, and creates a a passage between the um, the the and the back of your throat. Um, you just take it out at night. Again, it means sticking something up your nose um, before you. There are series uh, that can be helpful. Uh, again, this was. All the rave about 20 years ago, um, less less of these are being done now. Where the surgeon goes in and reduces the muscle anatomy at the back of the throat, uh, try to prevent the tongue from falling back. There's a new device coming out on the market, uh, which looks like a pacemaker, um, but instead of the pacemaker going to the heart, it goes to the 11th cranial nerve, uh, which helps um, ventilation in, in terms of diaphragm and um, something that's coming into to being. But really, the most part, effective sleep apnea treatment involves using a um, PAP machine. So here's your, uh, one of the common selling uh, machines on the market. Uh, on the right, you can see the hose that leads uh, to, the, to the mask, um, the humidifier on the right, so it's the water, um, so you get humidified air. And the machine itself that's delivering the pressure is the part of the machine on the left. And here the mask, um, the mask on the left is, um, I, I would imagine, it's on the market. I put it there because <clears throat> uh, the old mask didn't look quite that bad. This is the worst-looking mask I ever saw. Um, I can't imagine anyone actually wearing this at night. Um, it covers um, the whole head. Uh, nose and mouth, and I guess this would be a mask for someone with extreme uh, mouth breather and uh, lots of air leaks. Um, I imagine this being comfortable. The mask on the right is the typical um, nasal, they're called nasal pillows. Uh, there's the silicone that goes in each nostril. is very soft, um, and uh, um, the air pressure itself pushes the soft um, silicone up against the side of the nose, create a seal um, that um, um, is uh, obtrusive and and, can, uh, and not uncomfortable to wear. And that's just held in place by one or two elastic straps. Uh, one usually goes around the back of the head, and the other strap 
uh, around the top of the head. This doesn't show that second strap going around the top of the head, uh, but in place. And people who use this type of device um, can see their back, they can sleep on their left side, they can sleep on their right side. You can see how this man, this mask, it'd be for him to roll to the left, then roll to the right, because if he rolls to the right, uh, tube gets sort of stuck against his face. And the other devices, the, the tube actually go, comes down the uh, sort of arc away from the face. So it, it's easy to sleep on your left or right side uh, if you're wearing a mask, this mask. So we go to the next slide. I'm going to go away from, uh, from sleep apnea to restless leg syndrome. Um, and if you've ever had a night of restless leg syndrome, you know how terrible it can be. Um, uh, I, I tend uh, to get restless legs uh, when I'm on long airplane flights overnight. So I've already, in you know, my day's work, I get on a plane at midnight for a red-eye flight or even a longer than a red-eye flight and fall asleep. And I can't fall asleep because my legs feel um, the, this horrible throbbing and pooling pain. And uh, I and, and people have aching feelings or itching or electric or crawl feelings or creepy crawlers. For me, it's the throbbing, pulling uh, sensation, I, and it drives me insane. I, I don't get this at night, uh, nor just in, under the circumstances. People with legs syndrome can get this every single night, and it is really disruptive. Uh, the sensations begin um, generally after you get in bed and... and, and uh, um, um, and, uh, and there's no relief. And the only thing that can make it a little better is leg movement. So people be stretching their legs and kicking their legs, um, and uh, uh, it's uncomfortable to them, but the, the, the leg movement and kicking is disruptive to the bed partner just as much as snoring would be. Um, these things tend to be worse if you're tired. Um, as I said, it's it's maybe a nighttime thing, but some people do experience this during the day. And um, the, no one knows what the cause of restless leg syndrome is, but more common in people with neurologic disease than in healthy, otherwise healthy people. And something that we see all the time in patients with mitochondrial disease. Um, and again, very, very disturbing. Next slide. There is for restless leg syndrome. Um, probably the most effective therapy is medication to increase dopamine inside the brain. And here are a few brand names of some of those medications. If you don't go, um, you know, is, and again, the, these are easy to prescribe medications, so most people tolerate them very well. Uh, some doctors like to char, uh, start with gabapentin. The brand name for that is Neurontin. Uh, sometimes that can, that can help uh, alleviate the sensation uh, enough for the person to fall asleep and to stop the kicking. Um, people have used opioids uh, to treat restless leg syndrome. Um, I have a line through opioids. I would say that's the, a true, true, true last resort. Um, uh, location, uh, we all heard about the opioid e epidemic. And, um, you know, I th sort of think that's like, you know, being a rabbit with, with an elephant gun. Um, another would be muscle relaxants um, like Valium. Uh, and like away from medications that can be addicting. Um, and sometimes what, what helps um, is using a medication to increase dopamine. Um, but to get a patient to sleep in the first place, you have to add a muscle relaxant on, on top of it on some nights. So those are the treatments for restless leg syndrome. Just under the next uh, is insomnia. Uh, this, listen, if this problem insomnia had been solved, it would have been solved a long time ago. Um, and um, uh, but it hasn't been solved, and it's it remains a problem for <coughs> people who suffer from it, and quite common in mitochondrial disease. So um, I, I put in, um, you know, I broke down insomnia into a few, you know. Two different coded. Uh, didn't didn't get it perfectly right as I was making the slide. We all have stress. We all have a bad work schedule. Um, these are things that are 
very difficult to control in our day-to-day -day life. Um, and so I, I put them down there, but not much we can do about it. Um, um, uh, poor sleep habits are something that we can uh, partially control. Uh, yellow for eating before bedtime because that's what will cause insomnia. Um, got to look at the medications and medical conditions. And then, um, caffeine, nicotine, and alcohol, uh, those all can impact on insomnia. So next slide. Good hygiene uh, requires uh, consistent bedtime and wake time. Uh, what we're learning more and more about, when we learn more and more about sleep, it seems to one of the holy grails is that uh, for a healthy um, pattern, it's important to try to go to sleep and wake up in the same 30 to 60 minute period that you do uh, normally go to sleep and wake up day after day after day. And if all of us have different routines on the weekends, um, and but the idea is that if you if you normally go to sleep at 11 o'clock. Um, during the week, yeah, you'd be asleep at sleep between 10 and midnight on a weekend. And the same thing about waking up. If you wake up at 6 a.m. on a weekday, you're waking up, you know, no later than 7 a.m. on a weekend. <clears throat> the medications that can interfere with sleep, um, and and this obviously need to be reviewed uh, with the physician. Um, well, I put on limit daytime naps here. Handle disease and people with insomnia are exhausted, and the daytime nap can be refreshing for them. And so, limit them seems counterintuitive. I get what's what what's the worst problem: the insomnia or the uh, exhaustion during the daytime. If the is the worst problem, limiting daytime naps may actually help the insomnia. Um, <clears throat> uh, obviously, limiting caffeine and alcohol. Um, is 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 important. Um, why put a stimulant in your brain um, before you um, go to sleep? Alcohol interferes with the REM sleep cycle, and so that that's not good for sleep sleep either. And I see that there's no no use for nicotine in any of our lives. Um, and that not eating before bedtime uh, it would be an important thing to consider, unless for your mitochondrial reason you need to to do. That. That. So the cure for insomnia um, is, you know, not is, is far from perfect. Probably the most effective is cognitive behavioral therapy uh, for insomnia. This is called uh, CTI, um, and there are specialists. Uh, some of these are psychologists, some are counselors um, that um, teach can teach relaxation techniques uh, to. Um, to um, help people in, induce sleep. And there's a whole bunch of uh, other ways to deal with insomnia, some good, um, some effective for some people, um, um, not effective for most people. Uh, there are tricks, you know, um, which would include if, you're, if you know you're not going to fall asleep, um, get paid until you fall asleep or move to a different room in the house. Um, so these are all, all behavioral therapies. Um, I, I think that <clears throat> uh, the use of medications um, really needs to be limited to a large degree. What I found is that my patients who get put on these medications, well, they'll often tell me, yeah, Ambien worked great for a month, and then it didn't work, and I was my doctor put me a higher dose of Ambien, which worked great for a month, then it didn't work. And then they started. They they said it's either that or move you to another medication, which rate for a month and then it didn't work. And so many of my patients with um, insomnia, themselves taking these medications and still having the same complaint at the level of severity as they did before they started medication. The counter medicines that that um, can be used, um, melatonin, an alternative medication, but uh, certainly mitochondrial safe. And it ends up being effective for many people. A medication people can take over the counter is Benadryl, uh, which is an antihistamine and that causes drowsiness. Um, rather, 
be on bed drill every night than Ambien every night. Number one, they write themselves without a prescription. Uh, number two, it's not addicting. Um, the medicine, um, a lot of uh, treatments I listed here, acupuncture, yoga, tai chi, meditation, um, are all safe, but um, their effectiveness in mitochondrial disease has just never been tested. That, um, I've been talking for uh, 50 minutes. Um, I think it's time for some questions. So thank you for Great. your attention. I'll tell you, the, the uh, pic showed of the full face CPAP thing kind of frightened me because I have a CPAP and I want to have to <laughs> use something like that. That, I, that was I, wild. I went for a picture and saw that and said, that picture's a winner. I'm, I'll put it in. <laughs> I, I, I didn't. I want to scare people. No one really uses those masks, but I, I found a picture of it, so uh, I put it in. Anyway, we have a question, Dr. Cohen, from Minnesota, and the question is: uh, the the up with nausea every morning. We've had all the gastro testing done, and it all came back negative. Uh, she does a lot of muscle movements, twitches, and jerks in her sleep. They don't know how much restorative sleep she's getting, so she asks if you have any recommendations on that. So a polysomnogram you how much sleep you're getting, and and you really get a good estimate. It, it tells you down to the minutes and seconds how much time you spend in stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four, and sleep, and how much time you spent awake. Uh, it will tell you exactly how many times you woke up in the middle of the night. And did you wake up on stage four sleep or out of out of REM sleep? Um, and a polysomnogram gives you the answer. Here's the limitation of the polysomnogram. It's one night. And if you don't get the information you need on that one night, as a physician would want to do, and what my patients want to do is let's do two nights, three nights, four nights, five nights until we get an answer. If you don't have an answer, you know, after five nights, you're not going to get an answer, most likely. But somebody will pay for one night, and, and that's it. And you either got to get it on that first night or you're luck. Um, but so the answer to the second question is, um, Posomnogram. That's how you figure it out. The answer to the first question is, that I would have is: Is she having um, rest leg syndrome or some other alter of her sleep pattern that's waking up at night? And that too can be answered by a polysomnogram. I'm not sure how that with extreme nausea um, and um, uh, well, no, no the there's one way it could, could happen in people that become apneic, uh, they can become hypercarbic and the CO2 levels rise in the bloodstream uh, and can create um, some symptoms of headache and nausea as well. So, I, you know, just when I, when I see this question, I can't say anything but sounds like a polysomnogram may be on order, may be necessary. Uh, because okay. involuntary muscle movements and twitches. Okay. All right, let's move to the next question from North Carolina. Somebody put on a CPAP for sleep apnea. Their oxygen normal on the sleep study, so they don't need it. But uh, the questioner does have a mild respiratory muscle weakness that varies based on the day. Uh, the questioner knows the CPAP can sometimes be bad in neuromuscular disease. So the questioner is asking, how will I know if and when a BiPAP is indicated? So to my sleep doctors about this issue, I'll say yeah, the answer is the, the patient with mitochondrial disease, if they need a PAP, positive airway pressure, do it a BiPAP because the, the, their chest wall weakness makes it very difficult for them to push air out against that continuous pressure. So just start with a BiPAP. Again, the BiPAP machines have been more expensive than CPAP machines. And so the insurance company would pay for a CPAP machine first, and if they couldn't tolerate, then pay for a BiPAP machine, which is just like the most bizarre reason in the world because uh, they don't really cost that much. Uh, there may be a hundred dollars difference in the machine, you know. Um, so I, I try to get my my doctors to start with a BiPAP machine in the first place, and the insurance company really won't really won't pay for it. The problem with all this is that. If a patient gets frustrated uh, with the whole process, 
having another half a day off from work to go in and get a machine and get fitted by the respiratory mm-hmm. therapist. It's it's like, you know, they the professor they say why bother and you've lost the you've lost the whole battle because of, you know, that uh, the, uh situation. Um so bypass is usually indicated in anyone with chest wall weakness or, or muscle disease. Okay, let's go to somebody that typed a question in. Have you found treatment with antiparasitic medications to help with improving sleep in your patients? I've never used antiparasitic medications for sleep, so I have to plead the fifth on that one. I don't know the answer to that question. Okay. Moved this question. This was submitted online. My breathing during sleep tends to be very shallow. We have a CPAP setting at 8. Still like my sleep is fitful, but tossing and turning. I'm wondering if a bite would be more suited to my needs. Are you able to give thoughts on different machines for mito patients? So uh, a CPAP setting of 8 is a pretty, I don't want to say low setting, but it's, it's you know, most, most adult patients, um, at least those with um, um, sleep apnea, Tend to be in the nine or ten or eleven range. Um, so, um, I mean, so, is what the insurance companies allow is something called a, a CPAP titration. Uh, and what would say your but and this has to be done inside a unit uh, because um, what they start changing the settings while you're asleep to see which one works the best. They may start you at a CPAP of a setting of eight, and then as, as they see how you're sleeping, they say, well, this, this isn't working. We'll crank it up to nine or ten or some BiPAP settings. All the means can be programmed. Once, once, once you know what scene works best, the respiratory therapist can program the machine um, to for exactly what pressure is needed. Um, so this is called a CPAP titration study. And... Um, Sleep insurance companies will pay for that second to be done. Um, and polysomnogram, but if for what's called a sleep app titration study. Um, things you can realize is that if they figure out at 2 a.m., they need 9.5. Uh, they, they say 9.5 is good. You can go. And they wake you up out of bed and throw out of the, out of the unit at 2 a.m. Uh, and so that's, you know, you don't, you don't get that whole night's sleep. Um, which has been a bit weird. Um, and the different machines for mito patients, um, unfortunately, you don't get to try them out for a week at a time and see which one is the best with you. Um, uh, I think you just have to let your, your very therapist, um, you know, help you decide which machine. They'll often show you five machines that they can use. Um, some of them are a little more stylish than others. Uh, some advantages. Some machines have bigger water reservoirs, so you can crank up the heat to really make it nice, humid air, uh, which some people like. Others have small reservoirs, meaning if you crank up the heat, heat damn, all your water will be gone, and you'll be you know, breathing dry air for the rest of the night. So, yep. We well, that that begs a question. So, uh, if it uses this equipment, um, are any dangers? Um, in using the equipment, if you're a mitochondrial disease patient, in keeping that equipment clean, are there any respiratory issues that could result if you, if you don't take care of that equipment? Boy, that's a great question, Cliff. Um, you know, if when you when you when the respiratory therapist does a teaching, they talk about, about you need to clean the stuff every night. You wash with some more soapy water, and then once a week, you you know. You run air through it, or you use a special cleaning solution to run it through. Um, certain water reservoirs, um, uh, all the bad bugs can grow, um, and even fungus, and those need to be cleaned. In the real world, I ask my patients, do they clean the machine? And they look at me with an embarrassment and said, not really. Um, you know, the, the reservoirs do need to be clean because they really will it'll be like, it'll look like a fish tank. You know, they're green. It may not be green, but funky stuff grows in that water. So those definitely need to be clean. But in terms of, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> um, 
know, cleaning off the mask, um, and then, you know, giving them a wipe. And I'm not really sure that's necessary. And I've never, I've actually never had a patient, you know, get ill because of um, growing on their mask. Um, okay. Next question. My brain during sleep tends to be shallow. Oh, the, that's the old question. I'm going backwards. Okay, here we go. I'm 45 year old with me loss and I take Lunesta. Do you have any concerns about me taking Lunesta indefinitely? So that is no. Um, uh, and I, I say that because uh, there's no evidence that taking Lunesta indefinitely would be helpful. Now, if the Lunesta is working, and your needs, I think that's great. Uh, the problem is that if you're on Lunesta because um, the first drug didn't work and this is working, this isn't particularly well either, then on the Lunesta is just a crutch for trying to find something better. Um, and it just doesn't make, it's, it's not that it's bad, but it's bad for you in the sense that you're not getting the treatment that you may, may need. So, um, so there is no, uh, but uh, it's got to working for it to make sense. Okay. Section from Indiana. My two-year-old son diagnosed with Lee's at the age of seven months. Where he's likely to get sleepier as the disease progresses. On the contrary, he wakes up in the middle of the night and is also refusing his naps. Doesn't seem to be waking because of pain or hunger. Have seen this in other children who have Lee's. The I have seen in other children with Lee's, and and we have sleep um, to the fact that the brainstem contains the nerve clusters that make normal sleep and fullness. And in syndrome, the part of the brain that gets injured first and worst is the brainstem. So yes, is that. Um, um, uh, my, my guess is that the, uh, the sleep disturbance is, in fact, due to the fact that these nerve clusters just are not working properly. Um, I only, when I, I generally would say there's lots of bad that happens with Lee syndrome, but I wouldn't use the terms get sleepier as the, the disease progresses. Um, um, you spend more time. Um, I, I don't. I don't view it that way. I, I view it. I view it more as that you see more brain injury as the disease progresses, and less time spent um, in meaningful, um, inactive um, state. So uh, again, I'm not. I'm trying to say that. That this is wrong. I just wouldn't describe it that way. So I think what you're describing in your child with Lee syndrome is more of what I often see in my patients with Lee syndrome. A question from Arizona: What are your thoughts on the use of medical marijuana for sleep for mito patients? So um, this thing we're going to learn about in the upcoming years. Um, the, uh, you know, people talked about, about medical marijuana for, which I think is the same as marijuana, um, but uh, I think that's the political term is medical marijuana. Uh, I'm saying it a bit tongue in cheek because there's, I don't think there's anything different about the marijuana um, other than it may not be laced with other, other things. And I think that's the problem with buying marijuana legally is that the chance of it being laced with other things increases. Uh, but I think, but, but it's, you know, people have talked about it being very helpful for restless leg syndrome, uh, very helpful for insomnia. I'm not sure how it would work for, yeah, it might be effective at all or maybe for sleep apnea. Uh, and so I think we'll, we'll find this out in, in the years to come. Uh, Again, one of the side effects of marijuana is it makes you tired, and um, you know there can be secondary side effects as well. So it's something that you want to certainly discuss with your physician. Uh, marijuana has become legalized in our state, um, but there's no 
there's no law yet guiding how it's going to be implemented. So we're in this this funny situation where it's legal, but it's not for me to prescribe it. So it's it's uh, we're 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 sort of waiting for the old legislature to tell us what the next step is in the farming board. So in this, um, um, I guess, purgatory, um, you know, situation here. Again, we'll be in years to come. Getting to the next question, my son is 15. It used to be that once he fell asleep, he slept through the night. If anything, it was difficult to wake him. For the last one and a half years, he wakes up several times each night, occasionally wakes up due to pain, but for the vast majority of times, there is no apparent reason for him to wake up. It is extremely rare now for him to sleep through the night. Is mitochondrial disease associated with sleep disturbances? So the the the, last, the answer to the last question is yes, um, and um, you know uh, the dis disruption of the sleep is probably again based on, on one of two things: either that the pain is waking him up, um, that he's waking up. And because of the lack of sleep, has this body pain. Um, so, uh, you know, I think, think as you know, endorse that. Uh, what's going on with your son is um, part of what we can see in mitochondrial diseases. Um, I'm going to classify this as insomnia um, because that, you know, by definition, it means difficulty falling asleep or staying asleep. But also, we try to want to figure out. It may be the primary issue. So this would be a patient, for example, that you want to try medicine like gabapentin, which can relieve neuropathic pain, and see if that doesn't help um, you know, keep them from waking up. But I think this is going to take a lot of trial and error to figure out what's going to um, be a treatment for him. And okay. so that trial, that, that, that basically means that you, with there, if you if you say, well, let's try this and see what happens over the next months. You're never going to get anywhere. You want something for two or four weeks. If it seems to be working, you you can adjust it to work, and you got to try something else. I answered that question. One final question that we had submitted online, and the questioner wants to know, is there benefit to making sure that you sleep through the night by making sure the room temperature is correct, making sure you're sleeping in the right uh, clothing? Do you have any thoughts on that? So this is a, you know, this is a, a question where to answer it really probably you would need to do a sleep study, um, but it, you know to that that makes it difficult. Um, just because of the cost of doing it and the fact that, you know, insurance company is not going to pay for more than one. Uh, a bed partner can help, help you know, um, tell you whether you seem to be sleeping comfortably or not. Um, and so deeply they can't make the observation. But one of the things that has now become affordable for people are Fitbit type devices uh, actually help you the quality of your sleep by the presence or absence of excessive movements during sleep. So, I mean, I, I've been, over the last few weeks, experimenting uh, with my, my watch, um, which has a similar feature on it. Um, I think the Fitbit feature I was using before, like the wa this eye watch, uh, were better. And it gave me, it, it, it essentially told me when I fell asleep and how deeply I slept. Uh, when I was waking up in the middle, of the night, it actually almost gave me a, 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 a almost as good a printout of a polysomnogram in terms of movements. And so I think that'd be something that uh, if you set up um, your your Fitbit or whatever um, you know, activity um, if you'd like, uh, it can help answer your question. And so I would endorse looking into one of those to see how well you're sleeping and how, how much you're sleeping. Yeah. If, you're in a, if you have insomnia, you're going to be moving around. And, if I, you know, people say I didn't sleep all night. And certainly nights where I feel I did not get a good night's sleep, 
But you look at you know you look at the device, and you didn't move at all between one and five a.m. You had a good night's sleep. Um, you know the other nights when I look at this and I said, oh my gosh, I got a half hours of of sleep last night. In that case, I don't think the wall is line. I think it's because I was tossed and turning, and as I was not in stage three and four sleep. And if you get to stage three and four, your your REM sleep may not be that long either. So yeah, it seems like they're fairly accurate too. Yes. Yeah. I, I, again, it's hard to argue with the with the quality of um, the reps in these devices. I'm very happy with my Fitbit watch. It was just not stylish, and the band was falling apart. So. <laughs> yeah, I, trade, I, I have traded, the same, that's the same issue. Traded up in style, but in terms of the quality of the sleep, um, like the Fitbit, um, it was you know considerably less expensive. Well, it's quality. You are you are high quality, and we do appreciate your uh, privilege of your time this afternoon. And we also uh, will thank ACT for help in organizing this webinar, and all of you for your great questions. Um, just want to let everybody know the webinar has been recorded. You will be able to see it at umdf.org forward slash act later this afternoon or tomorrow. Just go to the drop-down menu where you'll see webinars. Dr. Cohen, as always, thanks so much. Thanks. See everyone in June. <laughs> yeah, we hope to see everyone in June, and everyone yeah. have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.